this talk. Okay, thanks for the positive feedback. Catherine uh, says that it is improved. So we are today looking at um, John chapter 1, verses 19 onwards. We will be looking all the way into chapter 2. Uh, so if we can have someone begin by reading out for us John chapter 1, uh, verses 19 up to verse 25. <laughs> And they asked him, What are you writing? He said, No, what? Money for the thing, and he added, Yes, I'm doing it. If they say, Okay, for you, that we may be at once in the world, so he said this, What do you say about yourself? I'm very sorry for all these technical issues which are taking place at this end. Um, yeah, so we actually were trying to read the verses 19 uh, up to verse 24, up to 25, where you have people who are questioning John the Baptist and asking with what authority he is going around baptizing people. Uh, we see in the other Gospels, that you have people coming from different uh, regions just to be baptized by him at his hands. So the um, leaders are now questioning, the religious leaders are now questioning this, and they ask him, by what authority are you doing this? Who are you? I mean, uh, do you have some kind of spiritual authority? Are you the Messiah himself? Or are you Elijah who has come back to life? Or are you the prophet that Moses talked about? Uh, so they're asking what... Uh, uh, authority he has to be able to do this and um, in response we see John very freely confessing it says in verse 20 it says that he freely confessed I am not the Messiah so John the Baptist did not take any kind of wrong credit for himself uh, we see that here um, Throughout his ministry, we see that this John the Baptist was a person who allowed Jesus to gain more and more uh, prominence and popularity. He never tried to promote himself. He was always satisfied uh, to stay in the background. So this, of course, would have to be a very you know, important learning for us, even as uh, we try to minister in different capacities. Some of us may be called to full-time ministry. Some of us may just be uh, believers who are involved in the secular field. But then in our own capacity, we to share the gospel, uh, we to spend time praying for people, uh, we to try to build up new believers in the Lord. So whether it is full-time ministry or whether it's just us you know, doing our little bit for the kingdom of God, with what attitude are we doing whatever it is that we are doing to serve? like John the Baptist, are we promoting the Messiah and allowing all glory to go to him? Or are we promoting ourselves personally? Because in the world today, the principle seems to be that if you have a talent, then use it for self-promotion. You know, a person may be very good at running a business or a person may be uh, uh, excellent um, when it comes to singing or uh, painting, or a person uh, may have uh, software engineering skills. Whatever your talent or gift is, generally the principle which the world follows today is that you would be using it for your self-promotion. And because of that attitude, in the same way my singing talent is a commodity which I can use, my knowledge of software is a commodity which I can use. We kind of tend to adopt that same attitude even towards serving the Lord. 
ministry becomes a commodity which we use to promote ourselves so that should not be the case um to use a simple example you know we have children who may have a good singing talent and um, nowadays we have a lot of youngsters putting up um, songs you know worship songs on youtube which is good but what is the motive with which those youtube videos are being put are they singing those youtube uh, songs uh, you know those christian worship songs to honor the lord or is it to show off and showcase their voices hoping that maybe it will lead to maybe some kind of recognition in the christian world so whatever we do we would first have to ask ourselves am i doing this only to honor the lord and to serve his kingdom or am i doing it um, to maybe gain some kind of uh, self promotion as well okay so that is something that we would have to ask ourselves because here we see john the baptist very freely confessing and saying no i am not the messiah he does not try to steal the glory from the lord in the same way you know he goes on to uh, say that he is not elijah either uh, because in the book of malachi chapter 4 is where there is a prophecy saying that elijah will come one day and he will restore the hearts of the parents and uh, so they ask him are you elijah come back from the dead and he says no i am not that elijah either and then of course they ask him whether he is the prophet that moses talked about in deuteronomy chapter 18 where uh, moses says that uh, just like him there will be a prophet who will come in the future and god would put his words in his mouth and you know the, everyone who listens to his words and who refuses to listen to his words will be held to account so um john the baptist says i am not that prophet either so now they say um finally they said um who are you give us an answer to take back to those who sent us uh and um, then in verse 25 they question him and they say why then do you baptize if you are not the messiah nor elijah nor the prophet no religious uh, leaders have given you this authority no title has been given to you so what gives you the authority to be doing what you are doing what do you think from where did john the baptist get his authority to officially go around baptizing people it was not given by the high priest it was not given to him by the religious leaders of his day he had no um official authority or title and yet he was doing this work so what does he say to you know in his defense he says the scriptures talked about me so in verse he points out in verse 23 it says john replied in the words of isaiah the prophet i am the voice of one calling in the wilderness make straight the way for the lord so he is basically saying yes i have not been authorized by the leaders of today but god has given me this role and i intend to fulfill it whether or not i have backing now the reason that i you know i'm emphasizing this is that not all of us may be part of an organization not all of us may be officially involved in a ministry but then you may be feeling uh, some kind of stirring in your heart to do something in your apartment or maybe in your neighborhood and then someone may discourage you and say oh you don't have backing of you know your church you don't have the backing up of uh, you know any any uh, set of leaders how are you going to do this do you have the wisdom for it do you have the capacity to be able to fulfill it are you putting your hands to something which you will not be able to complete so should you even be considering it so you would have a lot of people who will discourage you from fulfilling whatever god is laying on your heart so here we learn from john the baptist that first he does not take the glory for himself he only promotes the messiah and once he is sure that whatever he is doing it whatever youtube video he is posting it is only for the glory of god not for self promotion once he is sure about that he no longer has to listen to the people who are discouraging him because he knows in his heart that god has given him this role 
So if you find yourself in a position where people are criticizing you for something that you are genuinely doing for God's kingdom, you are not doing it for self-promotion, but there are people criticizing and saying, what backing do you have? What legal authority do you have? If that is the case, then like John the Baptist, you can boldly say, the Lord himself has appointed me for this task. I, you know, In the Old Testament itself, uh, John says, it was prophesied that I would be given this role, that I would be the one who would be preparing the way for the Messiah. So in the same way today, you can declare and say, the Lord is laying this burden on my heart. So irrespective of whether I have a body of leaders backing me up, I feel that I must go ahead with it. And in fact, if you look in the history of Christianity, there are so many examples of people who took this stand. I mean, uh, because I mean, we are teaching from India. To use an Indian example, uh, we have William Carey, who, you know, who wanted to come and serve in Bengal. But when he wanted to do that, his church did not feel that it was the correct thing for him to do. The mission society that he approached for funds, they said they don't have funds to give for his particular you know, project. Um, and the British East India Company, which in fact was uh, controlling Bengal and ruling over Bengal, they said, we will not even give you a travel permit to come over here. So he did not have any kind of legal backing and yet, because the Lord had laid this burden on his heart, he knows that he must do it. And so, he, in fact, he comes to Bengal illegally. And because he comes without the legal papers, he goes through a lot of difficulty and trial. But he knows in his heart that he is meant to be here doing this particular work for the Lord. And so he continues. So this should be an encouragement to us that whether or not people are backing us up, if we are really doing it with the right motive, not for self-promotion, but to promote the kingdom of God, we must boldly go ahead. Because finally, the, you know, uh, the, the kind of um, um, compliment that Jesus gives about him is so great. You know, the leaders were not very uh, sure whether or not to accept him. But Jesus himself personally speaks about John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11. And he says about this man, he says, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Basically, he's talking about all human beings because all human beings are born of women. So among all the people who have been born up to this time, Jesus says, nobody is greater than John the Baptist. So basically, Jesus is lining up all the prophets including Moses, the most respected prophet of the you know, Jewish people. And he's saying this, John the Baptist is greater than even Moses. So that is the kind of commendation that Jesus finally gives to John the Baptist. So you may not get your praise from people, but if you are sincerely doing whatever the Lord has laid upon your heart, the commendation, when the right time comes, the commendation will come from Jesus' own lips. And he will say, this person has been faithful. So let us hold on to whatever God has laid on our hearts. Um, and uh, so um, it says about John the Baptist uh, that um, he clarifies that he is not any of the things which they are thinking. And then he points towards the Messiah. And he says in verse 26, I baptized with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And uh, so humbling himself, placing himself in the background, he promotes the Messiah. And he says, I'm not even worthy of untying his sandals. And um, uh, the significance of that is something that they would have understood in their culture back then. Because they did not have uh, you know, a concrete paved roads the way we do. They just had uh, you know, dust pathways. And on the dust pathways, what was the kind of mode of transportation? Not your cars and trucks, basically animals. And animals, even as they go along, they keep downloading dung. So basically, if you're walking along a road, you're not walking along a clean road. You're basically walking on, along a road where you would have a lot of animal waste. And your 
sandals would basically pick up all of that which is why when the man of the house comes back to his home and if he is a wealthy man then the lowermost servant would have the duty of opening those sandals and washing his feet and here john says i am not worthy to even do that lowly task because the one who is coming is that far surpassing me you know in his status uh, so having spoken in this manner about the messiah having clearly understood that he is just a servant of god and all glory should go to the messiah the next day this is what happens uh, just that would be verse 29 onwards so if we could have someone read out for us from john chapter 1 uh, verse 29 up to verse 34 please john 1 29 to 34 the next day john saw jesus coming toward him and said behold the lamb of god who takes away the son of the world sin of the world this is he who whom i said after me comes a man who is prophet before me for he was before me i did not know him but that he should be revealed to israel therefore i came baptizing with water and john bore witness uh, saying i saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him i did not know him but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him on him this is he who baptizes with the holy spirit and oh. i have yeah and i have seen and testified that this is the son of god so john with the full intentions of only promoting jesus the very next day he sees jesus coming down the road during the down the pathway and immediately he says to the people who are standing around him he says look the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and uh, so he refers to this messiah as the lamb of god because all the people were very eagerly waiting for a messiah king not a messiah lamb they wanted a king who would free them from roman rule where they can have the dignity of having their own independent nation once again that is what they were looking forward to but here john does not introduce jesus as the messiah king he rather introduces him as a lamb of god and the people who are listening to this term being used would have found it very very strange um i mean um, you know the people were very familiar with this idea of a lamb of a lamb because they all regularly would take a uh, lamb to the temple to sacrifice it so if somebody named matthew is taking a lamb to the temple that would basically be matthew's lamb let anna is taking a uh, a lamb to the temple you know that would be hana's lamb so it would be the lamb of matthew or the lamb of hana and here this person is being called lamb of god do you see the significance in what john the baptist is saying they are all eagerly waiting for a king to come and occupy the throne and drive out the romans but here this messiah is being referred to as a lamb and what do you do with a lamb matthew would take his lamb to the temple to have it killed over there so that it you know it can uh, the sins which he has committed can be placed upon that lamb and god's forgiveness can be imparted to him why is hana taking her lamb to the temple basically to have it killed over there so that her sins will be put on that lamb and she would you know receive redemption in god's eyes and here someone else is also taking their lamb to the temple god's lamb god is taking his lamb also to the temple to sacrifice it and it's not just any lamb it is his son that he is taking to the temple to sacrifice it i mean look at that it's a you know we just think of the lamb of god as such a general term it has even lost the sh shock value this is god taking his lamb to crucify it maybe only one person in history can really understand what this signifies because one day abraham took his lamb his son to the altar 
to be sacrificed. So he understands what that means to take your lamb and go, especially when that lamb is literally your own begotten child. You know, so uh, that is the love with which God the Father sends this Messiah into the world. And the people we see later on, you know, in the last few chapters are not happy. They are not happy with what God is doing. I mean, God is making such a huge sacrifice for mankind. But the people are like, oh, I wish we had a king. You're giving us a, a sacrificial lamb. That's not what we wanted. What we wanted as a king. Their priorities were so temporal and temporary. They wanted a king who would drive away the Romans and you know give them independence. But God had greater things in mind. He had spiritual independence in mind. He had an eternal future in mind. So what he was offering actually was for much a much better Messiah than what they had been hoping for. Uh, so when the Lord offers something, he really gives generously. He really gives the very, very best. You know, so we see here that the Messiah, the very son of God has been sent to the earth, not just as a king, but literally as a sacrificial lamb. And uh, so anyway, in verse 30, um, John the Baptist talks about this person that he's pointing out towards. And he says, um, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed to Israel. So this, there are two points which John the Baptist makes over here. He points towards Jesus and he says, look, look, people, that person who's coming down the road, that is the Lamb of God. That is God's personal Lamb. So then he goes on to say two things about this Lamb. He says, he was before me. And second, he says, I myself did not know him. What does he mean by he was before me? He's obviously talking about the fact that um, the Messiah is eternal. He's been there from the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So basically here it's talking about the eternal infinite nature of Jesus. This is not somebody who was just born the other day. Because if you're looking at physical age, who is older? John the Baptist or Jesus? Who is older? Who was born first? If you know your Luke chapter 1, then you would have an idea of who was physically born first. It is John the Baptist who is born first. It's maybe some uh, months later that Jesus is born. But here, John is referring to the eternal nature of this human being. And he's saying, he was before me. And then he also makes this rather strange statement. He says, I myself did not know him. Not particularly sure what this means. Uh, because if you remember when uh, this whole story happened in Luke chapter 1, Mary was very clearly told whom she is giving, going to give birth to. Uh, you know, she is told the one that you will give birth to, he will be called the son of God. So she knows that the person who is going to be born is going to be the eternal Messiah. Um, John the Baptist's parents also are very much aware of this. Because when Mary goes to visit um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth says, the mother of my Lord has come to, my, to visit my home. What an honor. So she's also very, very aware that this person is going to be born. He's going to be the Messiah. Zechariah, when he's prophesying out of his mouth, um, you know, he says, uh, my child, you know, you are going to the, be the one who will prepare the way for the most high. So both, both the parents of John the Baptist were aware of who Jesus is. Mary was also aware of who Jesus is. And yet nobody told John the Baptist about this. John the Baptist would have interacted with Jesus during their, you know, uh, teenage years. Because, I mean, they are, uh, if Mary is a close relative of Elizabeth, then I'm assuming that even their children also would have met at least a few times. And so during the times that he was growing up, during the, you know, the days that he was growing up, John the Baptist was probably not told that Jesus is not just human. 
if that is the case then why when jesus goes to john the baptist to be baptized why does he say i am the one who should be baptized at your hands and you are the one who's coming and asking me to baptize you how can i and then jesus says let us do it because all full you know so that as so as to fulfill all righteousness so maybe at that time john the baptist was just talking about um maybe he was just recognizing the fact that jesus has is extremely righteous because he's been watching jesus from childhood and so he knows that jesus is not like the others and so maybe he just meant it in that sense maybe he said you know someone who's as righteous as you is coming to me for baptism shouldn't you be the one baptizing me maybe he only meant it in that sense because here in this passage john the baptist very clearly he says i myself did not know him in fact he repeats that once again in verse 33 again he says and i myself did not know him he only realizes that jesus is the messiah when during the baptism process he literally sees the holy spirit coming down in the form of a dove and descending physically upon jesus that is when he realizes that oh this is the messiah up to then maybe he only thought of jesus as a very 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 righteous and holy person but he did not know uh, that this itself is literally the messiah until that you know ceremony of baptism is taking place um so um once he realizes that this jesus is literally that lamb of god he starts excitedly telling everyone about it so when the people are standing over there and he sees jesus coming along the road immediately he tells the people look the lamb of god and the next day it says that is that would be in verse 35 um yeah maybe we can read out those verses so if we could have someone read out for us john chapter 1 uh verse 35 um maybe up to 44 yeah john 1 35 to 44 if someone could read out again the next day john stood with two of his disciples and looking at jesus as he walked he said we hold the lamb of god the two disciples heard him speak and they followed jesus then jesus turned and seeing them following said to them what do you seek they said to him rabbi which is said to when translated uh, teacher where are you staying he said to them come and see they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that that day now it was about the fourth uh, tenth year tenth hour one of the two who heard john speak and followed him was andrew simon peter's brother he first found his own brother simon and said to him we have found the messiah uh, which is uh, translated the christ and he brought him to jesus now when jesus looked at him he said you are simon the son of chona you shall be called uh, kapas which is translated as stone the following the jesus wanted to go to galilee and he found philip and said to him follow me now philip was from bethsida the city of andrew and peter yeah so once john recognizes once john the baptist recognizes that this jesus with whom he had grown up from childhood he is the messiah once he realizes that he starts telling everyone eagerly see this is the person for whom i was preparing the way this is the person whom we have all been waiting for and who so he begins to point out jesus to everyone and explaining that this is the expected lamb of god so we see two examples here of of john the baptist giving the witness and saying this is the lamb of god but if you look at the first time that he says this the people standing around him do not respond there is no there is no reaction but the next day when he says the very same thing to two of his disciples there's an immediate response they immediately leave john the baptist and start following jesus so do you see the contrast over here the first day, the previous day when he told the people in a very excited way look the lamb of god there was no reaction from them there was no hunger from their side 
But the next day when he says to two of his disciples, to no, to two of the disciples of John the Baptist, they are so excited, they immediately leave John the Baptist standing over there and they start following this Lamb of God. And um, so as they are following him, Jesus turns around and he says to them, you know, um, what do you want? And then they ask him, where are you staying? Because you know they're, they're hoping that maybe he'll allow them to come and speak to him for some time and clarify their questions. And he says to them, come, you know, you can spend the entire day with me. And they're so excited. So they go with him. And he, Jesus must have taken that time to explain from the Old Testament scriptures who he is. And he would have shown them how the Old Testament scriptures are pointing towards him. He must have explained those things to them. Because after that conversation, Andrew, who has gone, no, Andrew is one of those two disciples. He's so excited. He immediately goes and catches hold of his brother. And he tells him, you know what? We have finally met him. The person that we've all been waiting for so long for, he is here. We actually went to his house. We talked to him. He explained everything to us. And so he, you know, he takes his brother along to meet this Messiah. And that is basically how Peter gets introduced to Jesus. So when Jesus looks at Peter, what did Jesus see? Jesus had this ability to look into people, not just at their external appearance, but he had this, um, uh, this discernment of the Holy Spirit to look into a person and see who they really are. So what do you think Jesus saw when Peter comes over here. You know, Peter is as excited as his brother and he wants to meet the Messiah. So he's come over there with hunger, with eagerness. And when Jesus looks at this man, what does Jesus see? He does, I'm sure, see the hunger and the excitement that he's eager for spiritual things. But he probably also saw his imperfections, you know, his tendency to act hastily, his tendency to talk even before he's thought about what he's saying. His tendency to, um, you know, um, overreact. God sees all of that. But when God finally opens his mouth, when Jesus opens his mouth, this is what he says to him. He says, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. So he says, right now, yes, you are this. This is who you are now. But you know what? A day is going to come when you will be someone else. So the beautiful thing about Jesus is that you can be excited about coming to him no matter what condition you are in. And when you come there to him with all of your excitement, it doesn't matter what you are. So yes, Jesus does recognize that you are so and so right now. Yes, you have the imperfections which you do right now. Yes, it is true that at spiritually you are only at a certain point right now. But the one who looks at you also knows what you are going to be later in the future if you will continue to place your trust in him and follow him. So nobody has to be discouraged. So even someone like Simon Peter, who was really good at taking the wrong decisions, even he did not need to feel be bad about himself because Jesus looks at him and says, yes, it's true. You are Simon Paul. Uh, I'm so sorry, Simon Peter. But he says, you will be in the future, you will be Cephas. And what is that word over there? That's the Aramaic uh, word. You know, uh, the people of Jesus' times, especially in Nazareth and Galilee and all, they would speak in the Aramaic language. That was the mother tongue, you could say, because Hebrew was like too formal by now. People didn't really know Hebrew. Hebrew was like the official, their spiritual uh, language. And so Hebrew would just basically something they would maybe hear when they are by hearting the verses. Hebrew is something that maybe they would speak only when they would go to the temple. Everyday language is basically Aramaic. So the Aramaic word kephas basically means rock. Okay, it's uh, not just a small little uh, pebble. It's actually talking about uh, a rock. Okay, so uh, that is kephas. And so when you put that word kephas in the Greek language, it would be Peter. So Cephas and Peter are both referring to a, a rock. Um, later on, of course, you know, um, in the Bible, you will read about another rock on which the church will be built. There's a, there, are, there are two different words. The word which is being used over here for Simon Peter, this rock is different from the other rock upon which the church will be built. 
so okay let's just uh, clarify that for now um so jesus looks at simon peter jesus is not discouraged because jesus knows what he's going to do with this man uh, so you know just as a reminder to ourselves about this ruth if maybe we could have one person read out for us philippians chapter 1 verse 6 which can be such a encouragement to all of us philippians chapter 1 verse 6 being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of jesus christ until the day that jesus christ comes back up to that day god will never stop that work which he has started in you go to do it so all of us in our own way you know we may not become kefers but then god has a name in mind for each one of us today maybe we are where we are but we can be fully confident of this that is what it says in philippians 6 being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion because satan has this um, uh, you know satan is scared so he puts these negative thoughts in our minds oh you will never really grow in god oh you will never overcome that temptation oh you will never become uh, the the minister of god that you're hoping to become oh you will never be strong enough these are all negative things which satan puts in our minds because he's scared that we will become what god is planning for us to be so rather than listening to the voice of the evil one we need to focus on what philippians 16 says about us um and so in the same way i know um jesus continues to speak to even the others uh, to philip and then uh, this also nathaniel that uh, jesus speaks to so all of these people jesus looks at them he sees that they are not complete not yet perfect but he's confident that he will be able to work on them and turn them into people who will turn the world upside down because in the book of acts that is how these people are described these people became people who turned the world itself upside down later so just to focus on one small um, aspect which we see in uh, verse 45 46 where philip you know uh, very happily goes to nathaniel and says we have found him we have found the messiah and he says he's in nazareth so the minute nathaniel hears that this messiah is from nazareth he says oh from nazareth uh, forget it then definitely you got the wrong person because nothing good can ever come out of nazareth why was there such a low opinion regarding nazareth also why was there a low opinion regarding galilee because later on in this book, gospel of john you have the leader saying no prophet can ever come out of galilee so what is nazareth what is galilee in the northern part of israel you have a region which is called galilee galilee is made up of upper galilee and lower galilee lower galilee one of the main cities is nazareth so this entire region this is located in a particular place where you have many important trade routes meeting some of the most important trade roads which the roman people had built they kind of uh, met at this point so you have a lot of gentile people settling in this area more than jewish people you have gentile people living in this entire area especially in nazareth so the rest of the nation looks at this entire region and thinks oh these people spiritually backward they don't know anything they are mingling with all gentiles and another thing because they are not near the jerusalem temple you know that's a little distance away so here in nazareth you basically have rabbis who are teaching them the word of god explaining to them what they should do you don't exactly have levites coming and giving them sermons so the general opinion of, of people of the other regions is ah nazareth uh, who who teaches them the rabbis teach them and a rabbi doesn't need to be from uh, from the aaronic background or from the levite background he can be from any tribe and he can become a rabbi such people are training them over there what spiritual value will they have with that idea 
somebody actually says no prophet can come out of Galilee, which actually is a wrong thing because um, Jonah was a prophet from Galilee, actually. That's the fact. And in the same way, um, it's wrong to say that nothing good can come out of Nazareth because the Messiah himself came out of a place like Nazareth. Why am I dwelling so long upon this point? Because people sometimes tend to label us in that way. I heard this comment at least three times where people said, oh, the rural pastors of North India, they don't know the Bible at all. You know, what can they achieve? I mean, it doesn't matter which region of India you're from. What matters is how long you have been spending at the feet of Jesus, allowing him to train you through his word and through his Holy Spirit. Because later on, you know, regarding these people, what is um, what is what does it say in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says about these disciples from Nazareth area, you know, the ones who are supposed to be unschooled and uneducated and spiritual things. It says over there in Acts 4, 13, when the people saw the courage of Peter and John, it says, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Being with Jesus changed these unschooled people into something else altogether. It changed them into world shakers, into world transformers. So those people who say, oh, those rural pastors of North India, what do they know? If those rural pastors of North India spend their time at the feet of Jesus, learning from the word of God, spending time meditating upon the scriptures, they also can be world shakers. And then the world will sit up, the church will sit up and take note that these men from rural areas have been with Jesus, being trained in his presence. And that is why today they are who they are. The world will take note of that. You know, in the same way the world took note of uh, the disciples in Acts 4.13. So there are so many precious truths that we can grasp from this word of God, which are so applicable to our ministry today, to our church situations today. So, you know, let these things be an encouragement to us. So the Lord, when he sent the Messiah, he didn't send him to Jerusalem. He sent him to a place like Nazareth, which was looked down upon. And out of this place, the Messiah rose up. Okay, so we'll continue after the break. Thank you.